Welcome back to ECE 442-542. Hopefully everyone has done their passport. If not, it's due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. That's when most of the homeworks will be due. That's on a Thursday. It's not due the day that we meet necessarily, but you can turn it in on the day that we meet if that's more convenient or if that gives you a better sense of accomplishment than waiting and submitting it online. The passports can be submitted into the Dropbox on D2L and hopefully you're comfortable with doing that. If not, you can put that into my mailbox, a hard copy version if you want. Homework number one is now posted and it's a due a week from tomorrow on the 30th of January. Office hours, I have modified those. Now that the semester is starting, people are scheduling things and I had to shuffle my hours to accommodate new appointments that I have to be at. They're still on the same days that they were before, but now they're shifted slightly and that I think has been noted in the updated syllabus. So if you look at the syllabus, you should see that. If you forget, if you know where my office is, it's on the little bulletin board beside my office, which is room somewhere. ECE 523, I believe, is the room number on the fifth floor. Today I put together a fair amount of material on Laplace, block diagrams, state space, and Bode plots. The first homework assignment is assuming some state space and block diagram understanding and that material then is there to help you if you need it. There's reference material on books or online content and I've also supplied some lectures and videos from previous classes on that material if that's a way that you would find effective for you to learn that material. And in particular, if you're wanting to check your block diagram algebra, you could use Mason's gain to perform those transfer function derivations on problem two for homework one, but you don't have to use that. I would suggest you just do block diagram algebra. And we'll try to do some of that today if we get that far. What we want to do today is finish up what we started last time, which was this development of an equation for the transfer function in terms of state space matrices. The A, B, C, and D matrices, that gives you a capital G of S, or you can find your transfer function, capital G of S, in terms of A, B, C, and D. We will quickly go through that, then we will look at linear difference equations. We looked at a state space representation of an electric circuit. Now let's look at a student loan and that's now a discrete time system. We can think of the interest accruing on an annual basis and now that has this sample period or time interval of one year and that allows us then to see how much money it's going to cost us to borrow a certain fixed amount based on a given principle. And we can solve that based on the knowledge that we're learning in this class, and that's just one example of a difference equation or a discrete time system. We will then look at another example of a homogeneous difference equation, which just means there's no forcing function driving that. It would all be, the dynamics would all be determined by the initial conditions. Then we will look at a non-homogeneous which says now we do have a forcing function and how do we find the solution to that. And it's similar to how you can find it for a differential equation. You can find the homogeneous solution, you can find the particular solution, and then you can sum those up to get the total solution and find the unknown coefficients based on initial conditions. Then we will get into seeing if we now can express that difference equation as a block diagram, as an all delay. In the continuous time we were dealing with integrator blocks and connecting those up with gains and summing junctions. Now in discrete time our blocks are now simply delays. 
They just take in a, a value, they hold it for one sample period, and then they output a delayed version of the signal that was coming in to the input side of that delay block. And we can interconnect those to get, obtain a block diagram, a block diagram description of a linear difference equation. Let's go back into the continuous time setting, and I'll be, since I know you're probably wanting to text all of this information, we'll be using a lot of abbreviations. Now we're going to go SS to TF. So if you need to text that to someone, they'll know what you're meaning. That means state space to transfer function. So if you say that to your mom or dad on the text message, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. So now what we want to do is a state space representation. A could be 10 by 10, and the exams will only be using probably up to 12 by 12 is all you'll be expected on the exams to invert those matrices, et cetera. But A is now square. That's the system matrix. B is as wide as you have number of inputs. If we have one input, B is simply a column and it would be a, a matrix that's now, let's say, 12 rows tall and one column wide if we had one input. If we had two inputs, it would be two columns wide, et cetera. And I'm hoping that you're starting to get comfortable with that if you haven't already seen it. The output equation is this instantaneous relationship between the states at the present time and the input at the present time. And you may or may not have a direct connection between the input and the output. If you do not have a direct connection, then your D matrix would be zero. But it might dimensionally be, let's say you had three outputs and two inputs, then what is the dimension of the matrix D? It's three by two. So it's mapping this two vector into a three vector. Whereas the C matrix, if you had 12 state variables, the C matrix is of what dimension if you still have the three outputs? It has to be 3 by 12. It has to be dimensionally compatible with these vectors, x being a 12 by 1 vector. So you have x1, x2, x3 stacked on top of each other down to x12, and y is if you have three outputs, you have a Y1, a Y2, and a Y3. And that could be two voltages and a current. It might be two angles, or it might be an angle, a pressure, and a temperature. And those might be the outputs that you're measuring from this dynamical system. But we can still go from the time domain into the frequency domain, even if we have state space representations. If we Laplace transform that, capital X of S is again this vector that's 12 by 1. But now it's the Laplace transform of each of these component of state variables, little x sub 1 of t, little x sub 2 of t, each of their Laplace transform. Little x of 0 minus is the initial condition on your state at time 0 minus. And that, again, is this 12 by 1. But it's now the value of your state at the instant of time 0 minus. Or if you're approaching 0 from the left in terms of the horizontal real line being your time axis. But this is then just a... A was a constant matrix. We're not assuming A is time varying. So A slides right through, or the Laplace transform operation slides right through your A matrix. And you simply have then A little x of t, when we Laplace transform that, becomes A capital, capital X sub s. And that's now your one first term on the right-hand side of that Laplace transformed differential equation, and BU. Then what we do is S is simply this complex variable. That's a scalar that scales each of these, but we can't combine a scalar with a 12 by 12 matrix, but we can make that happen by introducing 
an identity matrix there. We haven't changed anything with the SI capital X product between that and little s capital X. But with that identity matrix, we can now combine SI. SI is now a 12 by 12 matrix that has S's on the diagonal. We subtract from that the AX combination that was on the right, and now we have the Laplace transformed state vector scaled by SI minus capital A equaling our initial condition plus this forcing term BU. Have you all seen this before? Blank stairs. You've seen it before. If you've had my 340, you should have seen this. Maybe you don't remember it, but you don't have to admit you don't remember it to make me feel better. But now if we want the transfer function, we can neglect the initial condition, which really means we're just going to throw that away. And now we end up with a relationship between the input U and the output Y if we solve for capital X of S from that dynamic relationship that we had from the coupled set of differential equations, X dot equal AX plus BU. We will do this process, or you can do this process, with state space representations in discrete time. And it's exactly the same, pretty much, or it's very similar. And you'll get pretty much the same looking transfer function that we will conclude with now if we replace capital X of S with what we said it was, which was the SI minus A inverse B times U of S, factor out the U of S from both terms, and now our transfer function, capital G of S, in terms of the state space representation matrices, A, B, C, and D, we now have that as C times SI minus A inverse times B plus D. If we had two inputs and three outputs, G of S would be a three by two matrix of ratios or transfer functions in that matrix. And we would have six matrices then in this capital G of S. We will probably be dealing mostly with single input, single output. G of S will just be a single transfer function or a single ratio of numerator to denominator. I wanted to just quickly go through that. That was what I essentially, we started last time with the state space representation, x dot equal ax plus bu, y is equal to cx plus du. We ran out of time and I said, oh, here's your transfer function. I wanted to just quickly say, here's where that comes from. You can derive that. You don't have to re-derive that. You just have to know how to use it now but you should understand where that's coming from. Questions on that? And we may never compute this, but in reading all of these different sources, they may say, oh, here's a transfer function, and then they somehow come up with a state space representation, or vice versa. They may say, here's a state space representation, and here's the transfer function, and you go, where'd that come from? Well, now you know how to derive that or find it or compute it from this relationship of your four matrices, your system matrix A, your input matrix B, your output matrix C, and your direct feed-through matrix D. A, B, C, and D go into this expression for capital G of S. Questions on that? If not, let's then talk about money. Or a discrete time system example. And in particular, it's going to be a linear difference equation 
and the example that we will use to build up this linear difference equation is suppose that you end up with a student loan at the end of your degree program you might be interested in I hope repaying that student loan. I want you to remain in good standing with the financial institutions. You will be gainfully employed when you get your degree is the plan and now let's see how you can work with the financial institution to pay off that student loan. This is just an example, hypothetical, because some of the numbers you might not buy into. The first one may be in, what's the principal? Well, let's start not too big. Let's say it's $5,000. And we are going to call that a variable piece of zero. That's our beginning balance. And then let's just assume some interest rate. And we'll maybe make it a little bit larger than maybe what you'll have to do, but let's say that it's 8%. You are now interested in paying that off, which means that now if we start this clock, we are now assuming that this is at time zero, our piece of zero. It's now $5,000. If we didn't pay anything off on that loan, that's going to increase with the interest. So interest will accrue and at the end of one year now this might be up here at a new level but what we want to do is figure out what's the annual payment that will actually knock that down with a 8% interest so that we have a zero balance or we're done with our loan let's say after 10 years. So we're wanting to push this out until we reach 10 and we want that P sub 10 to be 0. That's the idea. And we are now trying to find a payment that I will consider negative now. Let's say this is now the payment U that's going to take off from this amount so that now after P1 where we've knocked that principal and interest down with the payment amount. And likewise then, and we want this payment to be a uniform payment across all these years. So that now we maybe have at the end of two years what we'll say is P sub 2. Our time then is in years. So here are the variables that we've created. Let's let the initial balance or principle be what we said, P sub 0. R is the interest rate. P1 is then the balance after one year. And this U is our yearly payment, and we're going to make that at the end of the year. At the end of one year, we pay out the U. At the end of the second year, we pay out the same U. And now we actually have a relationship. But what we want to do is find the yearly payments. Which we're calling U and we want those to be constant. 
we can write a difference equation relating all of these quantities. We know that the balance at the end, or maybe I should say at the, yeah, at the end of one year, we'll call that P sub one. P sub zero is the balance at the end of year zero, or that's our initial balance. In terms of P sub zero and U, what is P sub one? So we have the initial balance, P sub zero, but that grows by the interest, doesn't it? Is that okay? That's most of it, but now we want to take off the yearly payment, correct? We now want to subtract U from that. And that's now our relationship between the starting balance and the balance at the end of one year. P1 is going to be, and we could rewrite that as just one coefficient, we could say that's 1 plus R P sub 0 minus U. That's P1. Are we comfortable with that relationship? The principal grows by an interest amount of R, which we're going to say is 0.08, but we then, at the end of that first year, we're going to take off from that balance a fixed dollar amount U. If we continue with that, what does the equation look like at the end of the second year? In terms of, let's say, P2, P1, and U. P2 is equal to it looks structurally just like the P1 equation, right? P1 and PU or P1 and P sub 0 looks like P2 and P1 to find that same relationship. And this now gives us a way to come up with a general equation. I could now say the principal at the end of the n plus one year is equal to one plus the interest amount times P sub n minus U. And that's going to be true for little n equal to 0, 1, 2, up to 9. Because we actually want P sub 10 to be 0. And this is how we could express that relationship between the money, the interest, and the payout, or the payback, U. And that's now, do you see the block diagram for that? That now difference equation has a block diagram realization. If you're visual, sometimes it's helpful to see that as a block diagram. If we looked at that as a block diagram, We now have this delay block that will process P sub n plus 1. And if we delay P sub n plus 1 by one unit of time, what's going to come out of that? P sub n, right? If this is P sub 2, that's ahead of P sub 1. So if we delayed P sub 2, we would get P sub 1. If we delay P sub 3, we get P sub 2, etc. But if we have P sub n plus 1 driving or being the input to that delay block, and if we assume that we have the payment U, 
then we can rewrite p sub n plus 1 as a scaled version of p sub n minus u. And there is now our block diagram representation of our student loan repayment process. And now you can go into the financial institution and say, here's my student loan, I want to pay it off. Show them that block diagram on a napkin and they'll go, of course, you had DARPS 442, didn't you? See, I get a cut of all that interest there. <laughs> yeah, right. I wouldn't be here if I did that, probably. But we can understand this if that's the case. And we want to pay that off in 10 years, but we still haven't figured out what U is. We could guess, couldn't we? we? If you didn't know any other way to do it, we could just start guessing values of U. Maybe I'll ask you to guess. What do you think your payment, yearly payment will be if you have a $5,000 principal, an interest of 8%? What's U going to be in order for you to have that loan paid off at the end of 10 years? and don't use your calculator with all the amortization tables on it, right? Pardon? 700, that's a pretty good guess. So let's now try to find U. And we'll do it analytically or with some numbers, some equations. We now know that we have P sub, let's say 2, is this 1 plus R, P sub 1 plus, well I guess that was minus U, wasn't it? But we could replace P1 with what it was in terms of P sub 0 because we may not know what P1 is if we don't know U. But we do know that P sub 2 can be written in terms of P sub 0 is that right? Now what's in square brackets is our P sub 1. Is that okay? So that now we have an equation for P sub 2 in terms of P sub 0. We now know P sub 2 is 1 plus R squared minus 1 plus R U minus U. Now oh, that looks... Thank you. I was trying to start with no principal, and then that would be easy, wouldn't it? My payoff would be zero. But we need a, zero, a piece of zero. Thank you. Does that look okay now? Does that look better? Well, we could just keep doing that. If we looked at piece of three, piece of three we know is related to piece of two, so that now piece of three is equal to one plus r cubed p sub 0 minus 1 plus r squared u minus 1 plus r u minus u. Or if we just kept doing that, we could then say that p sub capital N is going to be this 1 plus r to the n P sub 0 minus a bunch of terms involving U, but we can sort of write that in a collapsed form with a summation, meaning I now am summing from, let's say, L equal, let's say, 0 up to capital N minus 1 of 1 plus R to the L times U. 
Is that okay? So L equal to zero, that gives us one and that gives us our minus U. That was the end piece. Then little L equal to one gives us a minus a one plus R U. And we just keep doing that until we get one less from or away from the final value that we needed, capital N. Now we need to find U. We know P sub 0. We know P sub capital N. We know R. We know everything in that except little u. Except we, that's that kind of ugly looking summation piece. But we can clean that up if I just said, you know what, that's some value s, right? If I just added up a bunch of those 1 plus r's raised to different powers, they would give me some value capital S. Let's see if we can figure out what that S is. What is that S? Well, we've defined it to be this sum from L equals 0 to capital N minus 1, 1 plus R to the L. Uh, so what in the world does that look like? Let's just write it out. So now I have S is equal to, when L is equal to 0, I get 1 plus R to the 0. Anything to the 0 is just 1. Then I get 1 plus R to the 1 plus 1 plus R squared, and that just keeps going. Uh, I can cheat. I have an infinitely wide piece of paper. Sorry. But I won't go too wide. But this is now n minus 1 wide, right? Is that now the expression that we have for capital S? We know little r, we know capital N, we want that to be 10, and that mess is equal to S. So we could sum that up if we wanted to in this particular case. But can we find a closed form expression for capital S? And these are some of the techniques or strategies that we will use to derive certain relationships, maybe some z-transforms. We'll be playing with these kinds of expressions and sometimes this tail will just keep going and going. It will never stop. That's okay if that sum is well behaved or if s is a bounded number or if s is finite. Then we don't really have to worry so much about the tail. The tail doesn't continue to get bigger or add bigger and bigger pieces to where that S blows up. S is bounded sometimes or we may need to find when is S bounded? When is it well behaved? Here it's just a finite collection of terms which we can add up and get a finite number. Now how can we maybe look at that? What if I took S I wanted to take it in a different color and did everybody buy their colored pens at the bookstore? That was on the required list of items for 442 slash 542. They were a little pricey, but I said, ah, oh, I think my students can afford those colored pens. I don't hear anybody clicking their different colors. I did have, okay, you just brought different pens. But I used to have a student or two that would have a multicolored pen. I actually worked with a faculty member, and he'd always draw with those four colored pens. Mechanical engineer, what are you, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Keep that between you and I. Now this is on YouTube, right? <laughs> All right. But S 
what if I multiplied that by this ratio that these terms vary by? Each of these terms on the right are differing by each other by this factor 1 plus r. And if I multiplied each of these terms on the right by this ratio 1 plus r, then the first one that I'm going to see is 1 times 1 plus r, and it's going to actually sort of align up with 1 plus r. Then the 1 plus r times 1 plus r, and now I need to really do stretch my paper, because once I do this, where am I going to end? I'll have one more term, won't I? I will have 1 plus r raised to the power capital N minus 1 times 1 plus r, so that I now have 1 plus r to the n. And the trick is to simply combine those two equations. Meaning, if I take this guy and subtract it term for term or side by side, left side and right side, I'm taking s from s plus rs, and what am I left with on the left-hand side? This is now s plus rs, and I subtract s. I just end up with rs. On the right-hand side, I'm subtracting the green from the blue. I don't have a term in my blue row that's just a constant. I have all the, well, these 1 plus r's are constant, but a number, just a single 1. This minus 1 comes down by itself. And then all of these other terms cancel except for this rightmost 1 plus r to the n, and that drops down. So that we now end up with a relationship that will allow us to solve for this unknown sum, capital S. We can divide both sides by little r, which is our interest rate. And now we see that capital S is this 1 plus r to the n minus 1 over little r. And we have the numbers now. We know capital N was 10, little r was 0.08, our interest rate, and now we can solve for capital S. For our problem then, little r was 0 0.08, capital N was 10, so that S is now this 1 plus 0 0.08 raised to the 10 minus 1, and that gets kind of big. 1.08 raised to the 10th power gets even bigger when we divide by 0 .8, 0 0.08. That sum is roughly 14 and a half. So if we went up and just summed that up, that train of 10 pieces or 10 terms, it would sum to approximately 14 and a half. We can now use that S in our expression for capital P sub N. That was 1 plus R to the 10. Whoops, let me write it in general. times, can't forget the principle, p sub 0 minus that ugly sum which we just collapsed into capital S that scales u. And in our particular problem, we now say we want that to be 0 after 10 years. R was the point zero 0.08. Boy, this is getting busy, but that's 5,000, and S was the 14.5. The only unknown in that now is little u, our yearly payment. We can solve for that, 
and somebody guessed seven hundred dollars good guess seven hundred and forty five dollars questions on that example that's a discrete time system which we now have analyzed and we've learned a few techniques that we will use throughout the semester in terms of how to find these finite sums or infinite sums if we let that tail go to infinity. If it's bounded then it will sum to a finite number s and we can do this playing of what's my ratio between those and do this processing of subtracting one from the other. You're now paying $745 for 10 years to pay off that $5,000 loan if your interest rate is 8%. Now you go home and you tell your parents that and your mom goes, well, why weren't you just saving? That's what I told you. Just save up money and then you can eliminate the need for a loan. Oh, mom. So now you said 700 was a sweet number. What if we saved $700? How long would it take us to accrue 5,000? So what if we saved 700 dollars per year? And now you know the bank is working on this difference, right? So they're not going to pay you the interest that they're charging you. So now let's just say that they're generous and give you 6%, which you know is not going to happen from a bank right now. But back in the day, there used to be passbook savings accounts when I was little. And I thought it was ridiculous, the interest we were getting, and I think it was five and three quarters percent. And that was just, you know, the government would just say, yeah, we'll use your money for that. We'll just pay you. That's, we're just, yeah, that's nothing. It's not quite the case anymore, is it? But let's just assume we're getting 6% and figure out how long it's going to take us, and this is actually one of the problems you're sort of doing on a homework, except in your case, you're playing with a linear difference equation that represents a computer system that's servicing requests, but it's a difference equation, and now how many requests can you ask it to service, and how quick does it service those, or if I now give you an increase of 10 more people to serve, what's that curve going to look like? And I'm wanting you to plot that out for a first order difference equation. But here, what do we know? If we use the same kinds of variables that we've been using, let's say that we submit that or deposit that 700 at the beginning of time, zero. That's where we're drawing that time in the sand, that's now our first payment into the saving institution that's paying us 6%. What is P sub 1? And let's now write that in terms of our interest, R, our principal, or our, well, we could say, maybe I should say this is now, we could do it many different ways. We could say that's now u if we wanted to. Say okay u is what we're depositing each year. So now in terms of p sub 0 what's p1? Pardon? So now we have p sub 0 plus the interest, right? Plus u if we pay in another U at P1, at time 1. So we're accruing interest on this first year's amount at the rate of 6%. So little r 
is that, and this u is 700. And now you could see the block diagram for that, right? You have a delay. The feedback path is gained by 1 plus r, where r is now smaller than it was in our earlier. And the input driving that is now positive, not negative. So we have the same kind of structure that we had in the previous block diagram. What's P1? P1 is this 1.06 times 700 plus 700, or that's $1,400 plus a little bit more. Yes? So the P1 equation, the question was, are you adding in the same amount? Yes, I'm saying let's add in the same amount of money each year. So at P0, at time now, we're going to pay in $700. We'll wait a year. That will accrue some interest. That's the 1 plus R P sub 0, which is really the 1 plus R U. Then at that instant, we're also going to put in another set. We'll deposit another 700. So we're not going to just put in a one-time investment of 700 and watch it grow. We're, we're not patient enough for that. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and assume that we can deposit 700 every year. This now becomes 1442. That was a pretty good year, wasn't it? 1442. Oh, that wasn't sailed the ocean blue, was it? 14. Good. <laughs> Just checking. So we'd have to add 50 years to that. Let's not talk about 50, okay? <laughs> 1442. Still not a bad number, huh? It's better than 1400, isn't it? By the interest that we now have. How long is it going to take us to get to 5,000? We could numerically just iterate on this, couldn't we? P sub 2 would be P1 times 1 plus R plus U. And just keep going. P sub 3, P sub 4, P sub 5. If you keep going, you will find that P sub 5 ends up being 1 plus R times, did I write it down? P sub 4, yeah, I wrote it down, P sub 4. <coughs> plus u. Well, p sub 4 is actually about 39.46. Or now we're up close to our magic stopping time, which is 5. This is why they always say, oh, pay your car off before you buy it right? If you save money in advance, then you can accrue that more maybe easily than paying it off after the fact. But sometimes we're not that disciplined, are we? But now it's only taken us five years to pretty much reach the 5,000, and before we were paying off that loan of 5,000, of course, the interest rate's different, but we were paying off 744 each year for 10 years. What a difference 2% makes, right? So if we really needed to get beyond 5,000, then P sub 6 would do it, and we would be way above 5,000, and you can now see that we are advancing much more rapidly than just $700 every year with our payment. Now we, at, by the sixth year, we're pretty much getting a thousand dollars 
with that $700 investment, sort of, you know, if that makes any sense. So those are linear difference equations. Questions on those? And they're just sort of going in different directions, but now you know how to create a linear difference equation. These are first order because they just have one memory term in them. Let's look at something a little bit more involved, a second order difference equation, but let's not make it too difficult. Let's look at the homogeneous, means we don't have a U, we don't have an input. Let's look at a homogeneous difference equation somewhat like a homogeneous differential equation, except now we're doing it for discrete time systems. This homogeneous just means no external input. Suppose that we now have x of n, n is our time index, most books might write a K, a little K. I can't do a little K very well, so I'll probably be using L's and N's. Those are easier, but you might see it written more frequently as a little K, a lowercase K. I'm sloppy and slow with K's. N's are a little easier. Same difference, shouldn't matter. Okay? There's X sub N plus 3 X of N minus 1 plus 2x of n minus 2, and I said it was homogeneous, so it's being forced by nothing. It's zero. And let's, this is, it has two memories, or two memory elements, so it's a second order. Similar to a second order differential equation, now you have a second order linear difference equation. Let's give us some initial conditions. And suppose that somebody says, oh, we know that at one time step before we even really start, our system is at zero, let's say. And let's say that at right at the time that we've said is our zero time, in this system, let's say that x is 1. And we want to know what's x going to do as little n as time marches forward. Is x going to be nice and well behaved? Is it going to grow and then stabilize? Is it going to go up, up, up? Is it going to go bouncing back and forth? We need to find a close form solution. Similar to how you find a solution in differential equations. So let's now find a closed form solution. For this case. And like you've done before in differential equations, let's just assume a form for that solution. And the form that we are going to assume is, let's go ahead and let x of n be some constant a times z to the n, where z could actually be a complex number. That's similar. So here in this case, a and z are values that need to be determined. And if you have your differential equations memorized, you're saying, that looks kind of familiar. You could compare that with, let's say, an A e to the S t as a structure for a solution to a, a differential equation, a linear differential equation.
Now, if we're assuming little x of n is a z to the n, then we'll just scale that by 3, and then we'll make it capital A z raised to the little n minus 1 when we come to the 3x of n minus 1. And then we'll add to that 2 times what? Now we just, we've assumed a structure for a little x of n, that was a z to the n, so x of n minus 1 is a z to the n minus 1, x of n minus 2, a z to the n minus 2. Meaning that difference equation that governs the dynamic behavior of this system, wherever this system came from, leads us to a z to the n, that was x sub n, x of n, plus 3 times a x of n minus 1, which is a z to the n minus 1, plus 2 a z to the n minus 2, and all of that was equal to 0. Are we okay with where that's coming from? We're just using the structure that we assumed and we're replacing the x's with whatever they provide or produce. The x sub n, the x sub n minus 1, the x sub n minus 2. Well, we're trying to find a's and z's and no more alphabetical variables between there, just a and z, right? Just two, not the remaining number. How can we do that? Well, let's factor out a term that's common to all of those because we want a non-trivial solution. We could say, well, I can factor A out of there. That's common to all of those and I want a non-trivial solution so I don't want A to be zero. A trivial solution would be, oh, A equals zero will solve that difference equation. Duh. Yes, but that's trivial. We want something non-trivial. So let's factor that out. We factor an a, and we also have a z to the n minus 2 in common with all three of those terms. What's left if we pull out or if we factor a z to the n minus 2 from a z to the n? z squared. So if we multiply that together, we better get back that first term in our difference equation formulation. Doing the same thing, what's next? I'll do the hard part. Three. That just gets scaled by z. I can't even do the next one. What's the next one? Two. And we want a non-trivial solution, so we're wanting this to be non-zero, so we can divide that out. And now we're left with this term in brackets needing to vanish. We need to find values of z that cause that term to vanish, and then we'll have a solution, or at least we'll have values of z. And we call this, we give it all names. This, just by itself, without the equal to anything, this is our characteristic polynomial. If we set the characteristic polynomial equal to zero, then that's the characteristic equation. If we now have this z squared plus 3z plus 2 equals 0, this is why you had to take algebra, right? This actually factors. Help me. Is that right? So that those two linear terms, linear factors, will produce z squared plus 3z plus 2, so now each of those will satisfy that 
original characteristic equation. Z equal to minus 1 will cause this to vanish. Z equal to minus 2 will cause that to vanish. So we have two different values of Z that satisfy that equation. If we solve then the characteristic equation, then we have Z equal to minus 1 and Z equal to minus 2. That means that x of n, with the assumed structure, we have two now terms for that. We have some constant a1 times one of these solutions raised to the n, plus an a sub 2 times the other value of z that satisfies that raised to the n. Because our assumed structure was a z to the n, and we now have two z's and maybe some of you have more z's if I'm really boring, right? z, z, z. <laughs> but we'll be okay, right? I think. You can just put your head down. I, I'll just come and wake you up, maybe, if we have too many z's. But this class is all z's anyway, so I guess you're okay. You could just say I'm thinking, I'm studying. <laughs> Studying my Z transforms. <laughs> huh? All right, so this is our solution, except we don't know A1 and A2. But we have our initial conditions, and we can use those initial conditions to solve for the A1 and the A2. And that's what we will do. Let's now find A1 and A2. from the initial conditions. We were told that x of 0 was 1. And we can now replace little n with 1. So now we know a1 minus 1 to the 0 plus a sub 2 minus 2 to the 0 must give us 1. But that's pretty easy, raising things to the 0 power. Now we know 1 is a1 plus a2. A1 and A2 need to sum to 1 based on that one initial condition. And we can now use the second initial condition, which was x at time minus 1. That was equal to 0. That's A1 minus 1 to the minus 1 plus A sub 2 minus 2 to the minus 1. Minus 1 to the minus 1, or 1 over minus 1, is just a minus a1. And the other one is going to be a 1 over minus 2. Or a minus 1 half a sub 2. That's equal to 0. And now we have a relationship where we can say that a1 is equal to minus one-half a sub two. We can plug that into our other equation. We now have two equations and two unknowns, and we can solve for those two unknowns, a sub one and a sub two. One is equal to a sub one, which we can rewrite as minus one-half a sub two, plus a sub two, or a sub two is supposed to be such that one-half of it is equal to 1. a sub 2 is equal to 2. a1 is minus 1 half of that, or minus 1. And now we have our equation, or our solution to this unforced, or this homogeneous second order linear difference equation. We now have minus 1 for a1, scaling that z to the n, which was minus 1 to the n, that was its factor, plus 2 times minus 2 to the n, and that's true for n greater than or equal to 0. That's now, you give me a time, 
and you can now compute x at that time, where time is little n. If I gave you x at 10, you could replace little n's everywhere with 10, and you could now compute what x is at time 10. Is x well behaved? Well, we know what that is, but we could evaluate it and we would find it's zero. X of one, we could evaluate that, but that better give us one, which it should if we raised minus one to the one and minus two to the one. Is that right? Did I write down the right answer? Yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry, I went, that's what I wanted to do. Can't read my own writing. X of zero was one, X of one, because I was doing the math in my head and I'm going, oh, something's wrong. Where's the clock? Oh, we're done. See you. But X of zero was one. That makes sense, doesn't it? If we replace these minuses with ones, and we have two minus one, there's one. Okay, I can do that math. Then if we look at x of one, then we have minus one times minus one to the one plus two times minus two to the one, which ends up being minus one times a minus one or a one, minus four, or minus three. So now we start at one, we go to minus three. What's the next value of x? Well, that's x of two. And that's going to be minus one plus two cubed. Effectively, it's actually 2 times minus 2 squared, so 2 times 4 is 8. Now we're at 7. I wish it'd make up its mind. What's happening? We start at 1, when we go to minus 3, then we go to 7. What are we going to do? This difference equation is unstable, isn't it? We're just going to keep bouncing bigger and bigger as time goes. And we're going to be flopping positive, negative, positive, negative as we grow. Could we have predicted that or figured that out by just looking at those values of z that solved our characteristic equation? If we think of, and this is what we will learn more and more, but now if we think of this complex z plane that's supposed to be a unit circle minus 1 to 1 and j to minus j where were our values of z that satisfied that characteristic equation One was at minus one, and the other one was at minus two. And we need, for stability, we need to have those roots of our characteristic equation inside the unit circle. This one at minus one would give us something that was marginal. It would just keep flopping back and forth, changing sign. But that minus two, that's growing with time. And because it's negative, it's very high frequency. It's going to be banging back and forth and growing with a value of magnitude 2. We need things to be shrinking to be well behaved. We need things to have a magnitude less than 1 so that when we scale them, they start contracting instead of growing as time evolves. That's the idea. Questions on the homogeneous? linear difference equation. 
that one, we just had to start it off, and it went unbounded, didn't it? We might be interested in systems that we're actually injecting information in, or they have a non-zero forcing function or a non-zero input. We may want a non-homogeneous linear difference equation. Suppose now, for our example, since we solve this in two pieces, we'll find the complementary solution or the homogeneous solution and the particular solution. Let's just assume the same basic structure for the difference equation on x's. But now let's say that somebody tells us that they are going to drive that or force that with an input, a non-zero input that's one-half to the n. That input, is it behaving or not? One-half, then what's the next value of that input at time two? one-fourth, one-eighth, so that one's exponentially decaying. That's going to be what we would like to have roots behaving like that were inside the unit circle. They would have that kind of contracting behavior. Here, this is viewed as a forcing function. But if we looked at the homogeneous solution to this, we would set that right-hand side equal to zero, and we would find then that we get the same structure that we had before, now we have, let's say, eight, x sub h of n is now this a1 minus 1 to the n plus a2 minus 2 to the n. We would find those minus 1s and minus 2s just like we did before, except we would set the forcing function here to 0 to get the homogeneous solution. And that's what we ended up with before. But now we wouldn't keep going and find those A's yet. We would wait until after we found the particular solution and then combine those particular and homogeneous solutions into a total solution before we would evaluate for those A1, these unknowns A1 and A2. But for the particular solution, What would you guess it to be? What would you think its structure would be if this is now supposed to be in response to the forcing term that we've just introduced? Do you remember what you do, did in differential equations? If you excited your differential equation with something, what did you assume the result was going to be in that linear dif differential equation? it would have the same kind of structure as what you were exciting with. That's what we're going to say is true here. Now our particular solution will be some unknown constant, but it will have this one-half to the n behavior associated with it. We can now find a sub 3 by replacing or substituting this assumed particular solution structure into our forced difference equation, meaning we had x sub n, which is now just a sub 3, 1 half to the n, plus 3x sub n minus 1, which is now 3a sub 3, 1 half to the n minus 1 plus 2 x sub n minus 2, which is 2a sub 3, and that's equal to that forced equation.
we can now divide out a common term. A common term could be this one half to the n from all of those pieces. It's common and we know that that's non-zero. So we can divide that out if we do. We have a sub 3 plus 3a sub 3 1 half to the minus 1 plus 2a sub 3 1 half to the minus 2 is equal to 1. Just dividing all terms by 1 half to the n. And now the only unknown in there is our a sub 3, our unknown coefficient, and we can solve for that. Since we're short on time, a sub 3 becomes 1 over 15 if you solve that. And that now says that our particular solution is 1 over 15, 1 half to the n. And our complete solution is going to be the homogeneous plus the particular. Those unknowns, A1 and A2, how are we going to solve those? Solve A1 and A2 with initial conditions, if somebody's given you initial conditions, and then we would be done. Similar to how you've solved differential equations before, now you can use those same kinds of techniques to solve linear difference equations, and we'll pick up somewhere after that on Monday. So now we're finally going to meet on a Monday. We'll have Monday and Wednesday of next week. Don't forget your passport is due tomorrow and your first homework assignment is due a week from tomorrow. So you might get started on the homework assignment. At least read it over. I think you have the assignment due for tomorrow at